I am Maria Shemkalian, the Vice Chair of Pennsylvania Film Industry Association, and I am delighted to introduce Marco Siega, who kindly joined our mission of helping aspiring actors and filmmakers turn their dreams into full-time jobs. And Marcos worked on the following, Dexter, The Vampire Diaries, uh, The Flight Attendant recently, and just so many award-winning films, TV shows, and you started in the music industry, so there's so much we can learn from you. So thank you for joining us. Thanks and, for having me. Uh, it's, it's our honor. <laughs> so um, I'd love to start by asking you how you got started in the film industry. How I got started? Um... So I, I was in a, I, I always wanted to be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I'll start with that. And, you know, ever since I was a little kid and um, I didn't have the means to go to film school. School wasn't really my forte. Uh, I was very distracted as a young, young man. Uh, I was in a band mm -hmm. and um, my band started, you know, touring and playing around New York city and, at the time, this is the very late 80s, early 90s, um, music videos on MTV were just kind of starting to explode. And a lot of the uh, directors who were doing those videos, uh, everyone from uh, you know, David Fincher, Sam Baer, they, they were just filmmakers who were doing really interesting work. And I was paying attention to them. And I started to sort of focus on how do I, how do I do that? How do I get into that world? Being in a band, the easiest way was to just go and make a music video. So, um, you know, at the time we're talking, you, you're shooting on film, you're editing film. Uh, we didn't have what I think is available today in terms of being able to shoot something easily and then edit it on your iPad if you want to. Uh, so I, uh, I got together with some friends. Um, my friend Walter Schreifels wrote a song um, called Can't Wait, Wait One Minute More. And his friend, um, our friend Anthony Civarelli was a singer. They created this band called Civ and I shot a video for that song. I, and I basically went out and um, scraped it together with a bunch of friends. That video, we then took it to um, friends of ours at labels. And I was using it as a calling card to try to get my name out there. I was part-time working at an ad agency. I was doing anything I could to kind of get my foot in the door. Um, and then, it, then it's luck, right? Because that music video, the, uh, the band ended up signing to a division of Atlantic Records mm -hmm. and they put the single out and that video became the video that they put on MTV. And immediately at the time, MTV was a music channel and they just played music videos and your name went on there as a director. So I started to get attention from that very first music video. While that was happening, I went out and shot some short films on my own. And, and when I say went out and shot, it was really kind of scraping it together bottom of the barrel, doing anything I could to kind of learn the craft. Um, but that first music video just kicked open the door for me. And then I started directing music videos. The next thing you know, you're doing music videos for bigger bands. And, you know, each one started playing more and more on MTV. And before you know it, I was a music video director and represented at a small company called Notorious Pictures. And I had a rep who would go out and help get me work. So I, my, my film school was really just going out and shooting anything I can and getting together with friends and uh, just kind of doing it myself. I, I did have a mentor. Um, I, I, again, so much of, I think uh, you can talk to a lot of people. There's no one way to do this, right? There's no one way in. And film school certainly is a way to meet a lot of people. And I would never knock that. I just didn't have that access. But uh, my, my girlfriend at the time was a nanny for Nora Ephron. Mm -hmm. And just having access to somebody like Nora when she was making um, Sleepless in Seattle 
she, she was she wrote it and she was directing it. She's an incredible writer. And me getting to watch her from a distance, but within sort of a, an inner circle uh, was was really life changing for me because I got to see what it was like to work at a certain level and to how she worked with actors and um, reading material that she'd written. So having that sort of access to things that I just didn't have access to as a kid from Queens who didn't know anybody in the industry. And um, I didn't tell her for a very long time, I didn't tell her that I was directing music videos. I didn't feel like it was important enough. And I certainly didn't want to bother her with the, you know, here's a kid who um, thinks he's a filmmaker, but I paid attention and I, I really just kind of worked on, on improving the, myself as a filmmaker. I did a lot of reading and uh, went out and shot any opportunity that I had. So my way in, that was really my way in. The success came with the success of these music videos. Um, you know, once I, I then ended up, I started doing some commercials. I moved to Los Angeles from New York and with the intention of this is what I want to do with my life. So it's a lot of hustle and I'm leaving out, you know, the, the woe is me hard knock stories of, you know, you have no money, you're taking any job you can to try to scrape it together. No, I'm glad uh, you're bringing that up because it, it's good to know that people who succeeded actually went through these times. Oh, abso yeah. absolutely. I, um, you know, it's almost, it's funny because I, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he's going through a, a little bit of a dry spell work-wise. And we come from similar roots. We come from family, good families, but very middle-class, you know, my parents are immigrants and uh, I didn't, you know, English, well, I, speak, I spoke Portuguese at home. Mm -hmm. And the, just, you always, I always felt a little bit like, you know, you're playing catch up. So you hustle and you're constantly working hard to, to make sure that, that that you can get that to that next level. And I still think that way. It, when I'm doing a job, I, I, I'm all in on that job. But the minute it's over, I'm worried about what the next thing is. And I'm constantly hustling. Mm -hmm. Even though someone on the outside can look and say, well, you, you've had success. The work is going to come. And sure, that might be true, but I don't feel that. It's not built in me, right? I'm, I still have the DNA of somebody who's like, you have to go chase it down. Um, but I will say, I think the key for me was just uh, persistence and and. You, I shot some stuff that I would never show anybody and you, you, you make mistakes and that's how you learn from your mistakes. You try to not compromise. Cause one of the things I learned early on um, as a director, mm -hmm. you're hired for your point of view. So you, you, that's the one place you can never compromise, right? It, you can't just go in and just paint by numbers because you're never going to um, stand out that way. So I was always trying to find a way to push the envelope, find a way to, uh, for myself. And, um, and that was, uh, so again, early on, it was, it was music videos. And then when I moved to Los Angeles, I did a music video for uh, Blink-182. They had a new record, they, their first major label release. And um, that video hit it pretty big ended up getting nominated for an MTV award. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. Music video work started coming in pretty steadily. Um, but I didn't want to be a music video director. I wanted to be a, a film director. And then um, I remember watching The Sopranos. And that kind of changed my approach to everything because Although I loved movies and even as a little kid, I wanted to be a movie director. I watched The Sopranos week in, week out on HBO. And I was like, wow, it's so good. And I'm so invested in these characters. Like, that's what I want to do. And I, and I, early in my career, started hunting down, how do I break into television? Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of my peers were going the other way and saying, how do I go make the big movie? Of course, if I if I could get a big movie, that would be amazing. But 
I, I also felt like there was a lot of really great work being done in television at a time when television wasn't really sexy. It wasn't the thing to do. Now, you know, now some of the best work is on television. But um, back then, really, The Sopranos, for me, kind of kicked it all off. And, and this is where luck comes in again. One of the music video directors who I had come up with, Mick G, he, um, his music videos were blowing up and he had an opportunity at Sony to direct the Charlie's Angels movie with Drew Barrymore and Cameron Diaz, and Lucy Liu, and that movie was a big hit for him. Uh, so he went from music videos, commercials to Charlie's Angels. And then off of Charlie's Angels, Fox offered him a TV deal and he had a show called Fast Lane. So I saw that as my way in. I, I reached out to him and I said, look, man, I really want to direct television. I love this show. Um, I'd read the pilot script that he was directing. We had a mutual friend who was his, his cinematographer who had shot it. And he was um, gracious enough to say, and to take a chance because like they took a chance on him on Charlie's Angels, he now is in a position to take a chance. And he was like, I'm gonna let you do two episodes of this show. I had never directed television before, but um, you know, I, I saw that as an opportunity to go in, do a great job and try to establish myself or at least get my foot in the door. So um, that's a very long-winded way of me kind of giving you the, the in and outs of, of how I got started. So I, I, did the fast, I did Fastlane for Fox mm -hmm. and McG, and then slowly episodes of TV started coming in. Um, and then what really propelled me was, um, and I'll never forget, I was on set directing a show called Cold Case. It was on CBS. And I got a call from my agent, and she said, um, Kevin Williamson, who created Dawson's Creek, uh, has, uh, and a number of other shows, has a new show that he's doing called Vampire Diaries. And they have a director for the pilot, but they are not super happy. They haven't started, they hadn't started shooting yet. They, they kind of agreed to somebody. Mm -hmm. And my agent said, you know, if you go in and meet them and kind of have a great meeting, I think you can get this, you can take this job. And uh, the next morning I went and had breakfast with Kevin Williamson and Julie Pluck and I left that breakfast and they called me up and said, we want you to do the pilot. I just pitched them. I had a, a solid pitch for the, I, I love the pilot script and I had a really good idea on what I wanted to do. And I think I just said the right things. Um, and then I did the Vampire Diaries pilot, became a producer on the show. And then, um, you know, once you get a pilot, once you get a show on the air and you've done the pilot, it offers you the opportunity to do other pilots. People want you to do, they want, uh, pilots are, are very expensive and they're very tricky and there's a lot of politics involved. So they try to kind of hedge their bets, right? If you have a track record and you've gotten shows on the air, it's a little easier to get your foot in the door. So it's a bit of catch 22. But um, again, persistence, I made that meeting happen. Even though I was filming that day, I said, I can meet them for breakfast before call time. You know, could have very easily pushed it off and not gotten that job, but that job kind of changed my career. Wow, that's really inspiring. The immigrant story, you know, trying to push and push and work hard and a little bit of luck here and re building relationships throughout. Thank you. That, I think, summarizes the keys to success. So thank you very yeah. much for bringing them up. You've done a lot. You, you're very versatile in the kind of work that you've done. Do you have a favorite genre? And do you think that aspiring filmmakers should concentrate on a certain genre as they're growing up the industry ladder? Yeah, you, you know, I have a favorite genre and I haven't done a lot of my favorite genre. Oh. That's the funny thing. I, I came out of um, music videos and commercials that were comedic. Most of the work I did was comedic and my favorite movies were funny and, you know, popcorn movies. I mean, as a little kid wanting to be a director, you know, I'm coming out of Star Wars, wanting to be a music video director. I, uh, I'm like, I was, I remember I was 16 years old the day the Michael Jackson um, thriller video premiered and John Landis directed it. Right. So I grew up in a world where Steven Spielberg, John Landis, they were 
they were my inspiration and they were like big they they made commercial movies i was never really the um the kid with the indie brain let me go make a cool indie movie although i you know my my two independent films are pretty um polarizing uh, they're not very commercial that was never really my intention genre wise i always gravitated to comedy okay when i did uh when I had that opportunity to do that first TV show, Fastlane, it was it was a fun, poppy, like popcorn procedural with a lot of action. So it lived in a very, it, it was very Charlie's Angels that in the way that Mick G made that movie and that's what he brought to that pilot. So, you know, fast cars, beautiful people, slick photography, um, but it lived in a very narrow box and, and it's not something I ever saw myself doing, but I had a lot of fun doing it. The TV work I got was mostly police procedurals because that's what was big at the time. So um, cold case is a great example. And then when Vampire Diaries came along and I read it and it was this Gothic romantic book series and um, Kevin wrote this, Kevin and Julie Pleck wrote this amazing script. I, I didn't see it as horror or genre or scary or vampires. I saw it as a love story. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that's why I got the job because I, Kevin tells me the other directors sort of leaned into the vampires and the scares. And when I sat down with them, I said, look, this is a love triangle. And uh, this is how I see it. And I think it should be beautiful. And it's it's a gothic romantic and we should, you know, the lighting will look like this, but everything leaned towards a, um, you know, a young teen love story. And then it had some scares in it. Yeah. So, um, but the interesting thing is the look of it, I gave it, I made it a little, you know, dark in, in a sexy way. That was sort of the, the inspiration was like, you know, moody lighting. And um, when it became a hit, I, and uh, I, I got offered to do True Blood for HBO. And that was, you know, like an adult version of Vampire Diaries. And then out, out of that, I got uh, Dexter. Dexter was, I think Dexter's kind of has some humor in it, but it's pretty dark. You have, you know, you're killing a lot of people. So you start to get pushed into a box of my genre became, oh, he, he does dark stuff. And then Kevin Williamson came to me with the idea for the following. And that was all out dark. We went dark with it. So my success came off of these shows that were outside of the genre that I loved, but I was enjoying it and doing a good job at it. So you start to get boxed in and pigeonholed, um, which is why I made I made an indie film called Pretty Persuasion and it was a satire, it was a dark satire, but you know, I think it's funny mm -hmm. in a very dark way. And, uh, and then I did a, a, another indie with Ryan Reynolds called Chaos Theory. And it's, um, it's again, it's, it, it's not laugh out loud, but it, it kind of lives in my, in my um, wheelhouse as far as the humor goes. Mm -hmm. So as far as should filmmakers pick a genre, you know, if, if it's something that they're passionate about, they think that that's what they'll be good at. Yeah, I think so. But I just always responded to story. You know, everything I've done going, even Vampire Diaries, I didn't look at it and say, here's a vampire story. And it was a, in the script had scares in it. Mm -hmm. I was like, what do I like about this thing? And I, when I fell in love with the characters, I fell in love with the, with the love story. So I think you, you know, um, Filmmakers have to bring a point of view. And uh, if there's a genre that they love and feel passionate about, of course, pursue it. I have friends who are horror geeks and they just love horror films. They tell you anything about a horror movie and I can't. Uh, and that's what they aspire to do. And that's what they're out there doing, right? Um, I feel like I kind of walk the line these days where I can go either way. I feel very comfortable doing big action feel very comfortable doing um, special effects, feel really comfortable just doing, you know, family drama. So uh, I think 
for me personally, because I got pushed away from the comedy early on and, and went in different directions career-wise, um, it sort of helped me as a filmmaker and um, took me out of a box because I, I can do different things. The flight attendant's a good example. You know, I think the, the flight attendant, when it was nominated for a Golden Globe, it's in the comedy uh, category. It's not a laugh out loud, straight up comedy, but we do play the humor. And, um, and that's fun. That's fun as a filmmaker to be able to kind of walk on both sides of that. Nice, thank you. In terms of financial success of the film, what do you think uh, defines it when you are looking at the project? What do you think defines potential financial success of it? How can you tell, okay, this movie will possibly or likely, I mean, of course it's a high risk business, but this movie is likely to make it. And are there any genres or themes that today are really going well? Well, if you're talking about movies, mm -hmm. I can't, look, First of all, I, I, if I knew the answer to that question, I'd be a billionaire, right? <laughs> I'd be incredibly, incredibly successful. Nobody knows the answer to those questions. Um, I think audiences- What do you guess? <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like audiences, it, like what, what hits a nerve in pop culture? It, it's, it's impossible to guess. So when I go to meetings with, uh, at studios or networks or, um, and, and, I, and I'm speaking more from the television side because I made a movie for Miramax, I've made some indie films, but um, I think in today's world, it's even, the, the window's even narrower. Like you, you're either a blockbuster movie, yeah. um, you know, that, or other movies kind of don't get the attention they deserve. So, but in television, you can't really guess what's going to be successful. People do when something hits, like when Stranger Things became a hit, uh, all of a sudden, you know, the, there was a, an appetite for those kind of throwback shows. And when, um, you know, now you have a show like uh, Queen's Gambit is a hit and there might be um, an, an appetite for shows that live in, in, in that space. Um, Genre shows are always big. Uh, I look at, uh, you know, there's, there's always going to be a vampire show, a zombie show, a show about monsters, killers. Um, so you almost can't go wrong with genre. There's no guarantee, but people look for them. They look for what's that scary show? What's that scary movie? So the genre of um, horror and thrillers, I think, are are pretty uh, safe bets. You know, then there's like romantic comedies, right? It's tricky, it's, they're so cast dependent. But as far as what's out there that people are looking for, I, I don't think anyone really knows. I just think that uh, the industry is very reactionary and every once in a while somebody will make something and it hits it big. Mm -hmm. And for a year, they chase that, right? They chase whatever that was. Um, I try not to do that. I try not to chase things. You know, the, the material that comes to me, sometimes you can't help it. It'll come to me and I'll be like, oh, I, I understand why this is out there because that show was a hit last year. And they just, you know, this network wants to recreate that same, that same thing. But the, um, I, 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 don't, I don't think there's any one particular genre that is uh, in high demand, maybe superheroes right now you know, is big, like the Marvel world, DC world, that tends to do really well. Um, yeah, but I, I don't think there's anything else. beyond those. I don't think there's anything specific that you can okay. sort of point to. Okay, thank you. What do you think is the key to successful pitch? Uh, whether whether we're talking about structure or we're talking about the already the meeting, what are the secrets? So it goes. Um, I mean, these are great questions, but they're they're really there's no one real answer. You what know, I can you found tell. Effective? What's that? What have you found effective? Right. So for mm -hmm. for me, there's definitely a structure I use um, when I'm pitching. I, 
I like to start a pitch with the why, like why now? Why is it important? Why is a show important? Um, and what does it mean to me? I, I think it's always good when you're pitching to um, the, the, whoever you're pitching to, for them to understand that this is personal to you, that it's not just, that here's a great idea. Everyone can open with, this is a great idea. But when you make it about why you're passionate, people respond to passion. They respond to, um, you know, this, this is more than just a cool thing or a great idea. I want to make this because it's important. Right. So I always open my pitches with um, making it personal. And then when I get into the actual pitch, it's um, it'll change. But in a nutshell, it's breaking it down to what is the story about and who is it about? Mm -hmm. I usually like to go into detail on the who, because um, if you can get your audience meaning the people in the room or on the Zoom invested in the characters. If they care about the characters, then when they hear it, so you, you give them some backstory on the characters, who they are, um, what they may look like. If you, if you can point to an actor as an example, sometimes I'll do that, but you kind of give them a visual and an understanding of who these people are. And you, and you make that, you have to make it complete. You have to give them a real sense of uh, purpose and, and understanding that these are characters that are colorful and deep and more than just what's on the surface. It's easy to say, you know, the brooding, good looking guy and the, you know, the, the boisterous, a, attractive girl, whatever, right? That's easy. You, you, you want to get into what makes these characters special, get them invested. And then when you lay out the story, they have a foundation for those characters because you've, you've put that out there for them. Again, there's no one way to do it. And uh, there might be people who listen to this and go, I wouldn't do it that way. You know, it's, I, I've done it many different ways, but that's sort of, it, it's a, it's an A to B to C that I find to be effective um, when I'm trying to communicate something because pitches have to be short. Attention spans, it's not that attention spans are short, but uh, the ability to sit and listen when you're talking to executives, they don't have a lot of time. Yeah. So they kind of want to get to it. So you give them that quick setup of why it's important to you and why you care or somehow tie it to a person on a personal level, get into the characters, get into uh, what the story is. And then, and when I say the story, meaning if it's a television series, what is that pilot episode? And then you get to the end of that pilot episode and you want to leave them with a bang. Holy shit. I have to see more. I want to hear more. And then you go into, and then it'll open up and here's how the season will round out. And you just kind of give them the highlights and with another bang at the end of, and then the season ends with this, whether it's because you, the propulsion is important, right? People want networks certainly want to know that, this can continue unless it's limited. But so there's many different ways to pitch, but most of the shows I've done, you do with the intention of you want multiple seasons. So you try to set that up the best way you can. Mm -hmm. And should the seasons uh, have the descriptions of each episode or should it just be a description of a season in the pitch? Um, if, you're, if you're writing it and you're preparing a pitch, I think it's important to have as much of your season beat it out mm -hmm. as possible for you, not for the pitch. Mm. Um, no one want, is going to sit there and listen to an episode two, this happens, and yeah. episode three, this happens. What you do is you know it. You know what happens in every episode. More importantly, you know what happens to your characters in every episode and why you care, why we're going to care about them. Right. So when you give them the highlights and you say by episode, so you might say, and that's the end of episode one, episode two is going to launch into this by episode four, this is going to happen mm -hmm. by episode seven, you're going to be here. And then in episode 10, bang. So you've given them the highlights. They'll ask questions mm -hmm. and, and then you can fill it out. 
I, I, I don't think you, yes, it's important to beat it all out. So you have an understanding of what you want to do, but the most important part is to be, be flexible because um, our industry is collaborative and there's no singular voice when it comes to these shows. You know, um, the biggest writers I've worked with come in with a great idea, a great pitch. And then as we're working on the show, it evolves, it changes. You get to episode three and you realize, oh, you know that, that character that we thought was gonna pop up in three and seven and nine, oh my God, they're amazing. Mm -hmm. And you wanna see more and the audience, you know, you, you'll know immediately what starts to bubble to the surface. You gotta be flexible. Yeah. It is important to know where it's going and it's important to, to have an, an understanding of how the um, moving parts are going to work depends on the genre as well. If it's a serialized show where you episode one goes into episode two, into episode three, into four, for sure you have to have a plan. Mm -hmm. If it's episodic, where each episode is contained unto itself, then um, you should have examples of those episodes, right? Because sometimes a serialized version is easier to pitch because you, you have an A and a Z, right? You know where you're gonna start and where you're gonna end the season. Mm -hmm. If it's episodic, you wanna be able to say, this is the pilot and then every episode is going to be like the pilot, but here's how we're gonna make them different, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's different ways of, of pitching. Um, I also do, uh, visual lookbooks mm -hmm. where I give them something, uh, whether it's in the room or digital, uh, where they can look at it and understand what the show is going to look and feel like. I will give them references of movies, of other shows. Um, and sometimes it's a part of a show and a part of a movie and a part of another show and another movie. But I'll do anything that, that I need to to communicate to whoever I'm pitching to with clarity, what it is I'm trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing that they walk away going, he or they have a very clear idea of what they want this to be, and we love that. Or they'll come back to you and say, we love this part of that. Would you consider doing this to it, right? It, because it becomes collaborative. Um, so I, I think just keeping yourself open and going in with a strong point of view, being really clear about what the story is and really understanding who the characters are and why we're gonna care about them. Yeah, thank you. That was a really fantastic collaboration on, on all the bullet points that need to go into things. Thank you very much. You brought up collaboration, so when you when it's not your show but you come on as a director and you're working with a screenwriter who are very sensitive about their creation what are some ways of making it where your vision is still there and you're doing it the way you believe would be beneficial for the film while still being respectful of the vision of the writer what did you find efficient in this collaboration uh okay. TV directing is its own animal because mm -hmm. the writer is looked at as the uh, creator, showrunner. If you're an episodic television director and you're gonna be jumping from show to show, mm -hmm. um, you, still, you still need to be a filmmaker. You still need to have a point of view because somebody has to bring the material to life in a way that makes sense, is exciting, is funny, is scary, whatever it is, right? And uh, the visual language of a show is usually established in the pilot. So when you come in to direct, um, you just, you, you have to contribute something. You have, to, you have to be able to elevate the material somehow. So the, the work that you do with the writer is crucial. I, uh, I make it a point I haven't done a lot of episodic directing in the last couple of years. I've been on mostly my shows. Um, the Flight Attendant was not my show. I, uh, 
Greg Berlanti asked me to come in and do the last two episodes because they got shut down during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I stepped into a position that I hadn't been in a while, which was come in and execute somebody else's vision. Mm -hmm. But it actually reminded me of how much I love doing it because you, you do get to go in and have a point of view, but it's that it's understanding that it's the writer's vision. He has a big picture. So you have to come in respecting that. And um, I, I love to, to tone with the writers. I will break it down by scene and, and say, okay, so when, because it, you, anybody can read something and interpret it and shoot it. And I say anybody, any good filmmaker is gonna do that. But to make it feel part of the whole, of the whole series, uh, you, you want to make sure that your, your episode doesn't feel like it's suddenly a different show, right? So it is that collaboration. It, it is understanding characters that you, are new to you, but the writer has lived with for a very long time. Some, you know, a writer is in a writer's room working for a year or more on something, and then you step in, you can't just say, well, I think it's better if they do this. You have to sort of, if you have an idea that you think might work better, I like to sort of ask what the intention was, digest that information, and then pitch it back in a way that might work with what they're looking to accomplish. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of uh, television directors come in and hurt themselves by just trying to make it cool. Um, you know, go, I have this idea for a great shot and it's like cool it's gonna it's gonna look great but it, it doesn't feel like the show it's never gonna live in the show mm -hmm. they're gonna get to the edit and they're they're gonna it's gonna it's not gonna work um i think the biggest problem for directors is that when you're directing a movie if you think back to the origin of any movie you're gonna read a script and you're going to fall in love with it you're gonna, or develop it and then fall in love with it, but you're gonna own it in a way. It's gonna be the movie you wanna make. And then when you're directing a movie, you're a director. There is no writer to tell you what to do or to turn to, you're the director. In television, there's a showrunner. And that showrunner has to, it's his responsibility to run the show. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn how to work within those parameters. Um, Paris Barkley, who was, uh, I consider him a mentor. He was one of the first uh, TV directors that I shadowed early on. I shadowed him before I did Fastlane. And uh, he said some, it, something along the lines of, um, look, when you're an episodic TV director, you're handed a script because you, 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 you book a job. And if I say, Maria, you're gonna direct episode seven of, um, uh, Queen's Gambit. Mm -hmm. Episode seven is not written yet. You just booked it, right? And then when you are handed episode seven, you read it and you go, wow, this is a piece of shit. This is bad. You don't have a choice of what the script is you're going to direct. You booked the job and now you're going to direct that script. And some scripts are bad. <laughs> and he said, uh, it's your responsibility to fall in love with it. Wow. no matter how bad it is. So I've always had that approach. If, if when I was episodic directing, if I came in and I got a script of cold case that I just didn't like for whatever reason, it just didn't work or make sense to me. You have to sit and figure out how it's going to make sense to you. That's your responsibility. And if you can't do it as a whole, and I've been in this situation, then you do it scene by scene. Mm -hmm. I look at it and go, okay, scene one. How am I going to make this scene great? What, what, what's the scene about? Whose point of view am I in? Why is this scene important in the show? And it's a lot of work, but it's the only way to tackle that kind of problem. And you can only really do that if you're open to collaborating with the writer and, and being collaborative. Um, episodic television directing is not like directing a movie. Mm -hmm. Even when you're doing Game of Thrones or you know, big shows, it's like directing a movie in terms of the tools, 
but you still have a showrunner and you have to bring your vision to the project in a way that gels with the big picture. Mm -hmm. As an episodic director, uh, are you still responsible for uh, auditioning uh, or is it showrunner who is making selections? No, um, the, the great thing about uh, the Directors Guild is you're protected. Okay. There's, there, every, uh, if you're directing television um, at a professional level in DGA show, yeah. <clears throat> that you have creative rights. And um, these are rights that nobody, no showrunner, no studio can take away from you. You have to be, you, oh. you, you are involved in the casting. Mm -hmm. uh, you are involved in the editing. You have your say on your movie. So you have a, an equal voice. Um, so yes, to answer your question, yes. It, obviously there are characters that were cast before you arrived. There are regulars, but anybody that's being cast for your episode, you, you have an opportunity to hold the auditions and to cast those people. Obviously they need to be approved and there will always be a debate if you want person X and they want person Y, you may not get your person, mm -hmm. but you have a say, you have a total say. Um, but the final decision ultimately lies with the network. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, what guidance do you have for the, and I'm not talking about, of course, the lead actors who already know what they're doing. I'm talking about the newer actors who are getting maybe under five or guest star roles. What is your guidance for the auditioning actors? How can they make themselves remembered? What are you looking for when you're looking through these uh, actors? Um, that, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm in the middle of casting right now mm -hmm. and um, we're in Massachusetts and we have a number of we're cross-boarding the whole 10 episodes. So I'm casting people from episode 10, episode seven, and, um, and I haven't shot any of, you know, it's, we, it's all mixed and matched. And I'm looking at these auditions and I'm finding, I'm finding people to be a little lazy. Mm. And, and I, I don't mean that to be disparaging of them or, you know, it's just that, the actors that pop are the ones that come in and, and have a take, have a point of view. Mm -hmm. I will watch if, if a casting director sends me an audition and it's one take and I think someone's interesting, I will say, bring them back and have them do it a couple of ways. I wanna see, cause I wanna see their range. I always appreciate when an actor comes in, especially if I can't be there in person because of the whole coronavirus, most of the auditions are taped. And the ones that have really jumped out for me are the ones that come in, um, do the scene. They, first of all, know the material. Mm -hmm. this, the, the second somebody's reading in an audition, I shut off. Mm -hmm. I, I can't, I, I, it, because you're auditioning for a part in a show where you're not going to be reading. I want to see what you're doing. So the second you're, reading something immediately i'm like okay no move next i don't have time for that um if they have a great look and i feel like they have potential i may sometimes say can you have that person come back and do it without reading mm -hmm. and then they do and sometimes you realize oh they're reading because they can't do it. Mm -hmm. right it's easy to perform when you're reading something and you know but you're reading it and I can't see your eyes, I can't see your emotion. So uh, number one is be off book, know your material. So start with that. But uh, also have a, have a take, have a, have a point of view on what it, what it is that you think this character, what are you gonna bring to it? Even if it's wrong, because if it, what I was about to say was, I appreciate when an actor does it two or three times and and I can look at the first one and look at the second one and see where they changed it and what they're doing differently. If it's two or three takes and it's the same, it's just maybe the words are a little better. It doesn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not seeing any color. I'm not seeing any range. I like the idea of, of understanding that an actor can um, get me somewhere emotionally, 
can get me somewhere comedically or or get me somewhere with just stillness. It's like, uh, you know, there's a famous story of Jack Lemon and um, I'm gonna, I can't remember, but the idea is he's doing, uh, he does take after take after take and it's like, do it again, do less, do less, do less. And then Jack Lemon finally says, if I do any less, I, I won't be acting. It's like, exactly, huh. yeah, you know, I want to see that you can, yeah. that you have a range of doing things so that I can give you a note. I don't like to show up on the day and have to direct people. Mm. I want to give them a note. Mm. I want to be able to make an adjustment. Television goes at a hundred miles an hour. You don't have the luxury sometimes of rehearsing. Mm. So when I'm casting, I want to know, I want to have the confidence in an audition that somebody can come in and do it. Um, so I, I don't know what advice is in there, but there's take actually what you great can from advice there. because it's it's um, with the self tapes. I hear a lot from actors that they it's hard to choose because they record a few and it's hard to choose because they do it differently and they don't know what director wants. But you mentioning that you would like to see a few is actually really great guidance because then many would actually include them and one of them might be really great. So thank you. This is actually yeah. And, and look, I think it's important also to mention. Uh, unfortunately, the presentation is important as well. I've seen some pretty decent auditions done so poorly that the sound is bad, the lighting is bad, and it takes you out of it. You know, it's your craft. It's your you're 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 sending an audition to somebody who might put you in something that might change your life. Why not take the time to make sure that it sounds good and looks good? It's so easy today, right? Like you're just moving lights around because you're worried about your shadow, right? <laughs> if they care that much, it's going to make it stand out. So that's important to, to keep in mind as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you. This is very helpful to our actor viewers. There are many different producing titles. What are the differences and responsibilities between all those titles? And what if there are two people of the same title? How are those responsibilities divided? <laughs> it's a fantastic question. Um, that is very complicated. <laughs> uh, so when you say aspiring producers, uh, you know, if, some, if I was talking to a classroom of Mm -hmm. uh, aspiring producers, my first question would be, what kind of producer do you want to be? Mm -hmm. um, my, my producer could be the money guy. Mm -hmm. Meaning, when I say the money guy, it's his responsibility to deal with the budget, right? He gets budgets from all the departments. He sits down and he makes sure that we're sticking to a budget. And he figures out it's, it's all you're handed a budget. The producer did the budget, mm -hmm. right? That's your line producer. Um, a lot of line producers are very creative and they have to be because they, you need that brain to make sure that you're servicing story as well as money. But the title of line producer in the television world and in the feature world are, are very different than the title of producer. Mm -hmm or executive producer. The producer on a feature is your creative producer. He's, you know, it's Jerry Bruckheimer. He's gonna have a big hand in um, what the movie is meant to, uh, how are you gonna sell the movie? What it's meant to look like? Who's, who's gonna be in the movie? How are you gonna market the movie? Who your director's gonna be? You know, it's, it's, you're sort of producing the thing. Mm -hmm. In television, the producing, just a producer title is often a title given to writers in the writer's room uh, because they will produce their episode. Meaning Maria writes episode four, uh, Marcos writes episode six, but we're not the showrunners. We're writers on the show, right? We often have titles based on our experience. So if you've been doing it for a while, sometimes you'll be a co-EP. It's just a title, but you're a producer. So you're in Los Angeles in the writer's room, everyone's writing 
the episodes, your show, you hand your episode to the showrunner, he tweets it, he re, or she rewrites it, and uh, you work on it together, you get the writing credit, and when it's time to shoot your episode, often you will go to the, sit to the location and sit with the director, and you're the writer of the show, and you're producing that episode, meaning you're there just to make sure that the things you talked about in the writer's room are working, that the director is servicing the story and you guys aren't, you know, they're not going off the rails and making it uh, a dark comedy when it wants to be a broad comedy, right? Um, so a creative producer can, that can be a role, but you would have multiple producers with the same title, but you're, you're not all doing the same job at the same time, mm -hmm. right? So you'd be doing your episode another producer would be doing their episode, mm -hmm. uh, but you get a credit on the whole series because mm. you don't just get a credit on that one. You get a writing credit on one episode, but as a producer, it blankets the whole time that you're there because in the writer's room, technically you're producing, you're, you're coming up with the ideas, you're pitching, even if it's the episode I'm writing, uh, you might've pitched the car chase sequence in the room, right? You're, you're still contributing. So when it comes to credits uh, in, uh, in television, there's so many, you know, it's, it's producer, co-producer, co-EP. That's usually a, uh, a level of like where you are on the, in the pecking order, um, executive producer being the top. Mm -hmm. The showrunner is an executive producer, but the showrunner is executive producer slash showrunner. He's the final, she, he, final say, right? Um, so if I'm doing uh, the following with Kevin Williamson and he and I are the only two executive producers, there's still a pecking order. He's the showrunner, executive producer. I'm the director, executive producer. He's technically my boss. Mm -hmm. like the showrunner is the, the guy. When you have a partnership, like Kevin and I ended up having um, when he left the show and he left the show with me, we brought in two other showrunners, but we were partners because I, I was there and I was there for Kevin. I was you know, there on his behalf. So executive producers on a show, there could be five, there could be 10. Uh, sometimes they're just vanity credits. I did, I did the pilot of Charlie's Angels for ABC and executive producer Drew Barrymore, executive producer... Al Goff, Miles Millar, executive producer Marco Siega, executive, like there were 10 executive producers, right? But we all had roles. Drew was, her company was brought the, the show in because she did the movie to ABC and uh, she was an executive producer. She had the power to come in and say, hey, I think it should be this, but she didn't. She was an executive producer in title. Mm -hmm. You know, she's Drew Barrymore. When they were marketing the show, they would say from executive producer Drew Barrymore mm -hmm. because she's a celebrity, a star. Um, and that's not to say that they don't do the work. Often they do, but sometimes it's just a title. So uh, when you have an actor who's the lead on a show and you've done four seasons and you're a hit show and suddenly season five, you see, oh, that actor is also an executive producer. It's because they renegotiated the deal. The show is a hit. They're an important part of the show and they want an executive producer credit. It's a vanity credit, yeah. but it's still a credit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think for aspiring producers, you're not gonna get a vanity credit. You're gonna have to earn your credit. Yeah. I've earned my credits and uh, you get to a point where I'm an executive producer. When I, when I take an executive producer title, I'm doing the work. I'm doing a lot of work. I'm, I'm either creating the world that we're in, I'm gonna direct the pilot, or I'm overseeing the creative. So I think for most people, like all these producers that you see and they're working their way up, they're doing the work and they're earning those titles. Mm -hmm. um, each title, you know, the, the more, the bigger you get with title, there's more money also. So that's kind of how it breaks down, but, um, that we could go on forever because there's so many different aspects of what producers do um, 
and they do different things on different shows, but there's the financial side of producing and there's a creative side of producing. I live pretty squarely in the creative side, but because I've been doing my own shows for a while, I also am involved. I understand the financial side and I make decisions creatively sometimes to make it work. So if something in the script calls for, you know, uh, a thousand extras and crashing of an airplane and we want to do it, then I have to look at the big picture and go, we're going to do it. But these three episodes are going to be in the hotel room, in, <laughs> in an apartment, because we're going to save that money to do that thing. Right. And that's my responsibility as, as an executive producer is to help figure out how to, um, compartmentalize and make all those things work mm -hmm. thank you and how do you select your projects what are some important elements for you to agree as either producer or director uh, well like i said earlier if it's episodic directing i can't mm -hmm. i can select a show if i love a show and pursue it yeah. but when i get the script i have no yeah you know, at that point the ship is sailed. I'm going to get whatever script I get. Um, when I'm selecting projects to develop or projects to do from scratch, mm -hmm. it's 100% story. I, I think there's nothing else for me. It's just I, if I read, read it and, and, I'm, and I'm in the story and the characters and I'm invested, then immediately I'm like, I, I, want, to, I want to tell this story. Uh, I've never written anything where I'm like, oh, this is cool. Um, I want to do it because of that, you know? Um, I don't, I don't do it because of like action or, you know, just genre, just because it's scary. It's story. With any thing you do, any show that you watch, you become invested in characters and in story. And that's what makes you want to watch more of it, right? It doesn't matter how many explosions are in it or how many times you're scared if you're not invested. And so that's kind of how I start. Just, uh, I get a lot of things sent to me that, um, are really well written but i don't feel it yeah you don't feel the story um there's a lot of very talented writers who i'm in awe of and um and and just haven't written the right thing for me mm -hmm. and then sometimes there's a fantastic story and it's not well written mm -hmm. and then you try to bring people on to you know who can make it better i i learned what i learned about myself is that i'm not a good writer I'm, I'm great with story and I can help a writer and I can bring a story to life, but, um, where, you know, my weakness is dialogue. That's an art. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a learned art. It can be a learned art, but I think, um, it's something that comes with a lot of practice, a lot of doing and, um, to write dialogue that's good and engaging and real and, you know, wants to be all the things that you want it to be is, is difficult. Mm -hmm. um, I, I read scripts sometimes and I'm like, this is great. The writing's not bad, but the dialogue's a little clunky and, you know, who am I to judge it? <laughs> but you, you can only respond to, you know, what you feel. Yeah. Thank you. What is your guidance for the filmmakers who don't have an agent yet, but are looking to meet producers and pitch to them? What are some ways of meeting and attracting producers for, again, those who haven't gotten representation yet? You know, crossing that bridge from where you are not represented yet to where you already get called for projects. That's what we're trying to help cross that bridge yeah you know look it's it's what i first said um yeah. it's persistence mm -hmm. it's um not giving up you know there's a fine line between persistence and annoyance <laughs> but um if you know your audience and you know if you're if, if you believe in yourself and your work is good mm -hmm. it will get noticed mm -hmm. if you believe in yourself and your work isn't good and you keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And when I say your work isn't good, meaning if you start to see that the thing that you're trying to 
hang your hat on is keeps getting rejected, don't don't give up. Persistence is important, but but always take a step back and look at it and go, how can I make it better? How can I? What are people saying about it that is not getting attention? Right? I would never say give up on it. I would say just listen to listen to what people are saying. Not specific like listen to Joe Schmo if he says make it funnier, right? But take a sampling of what everyone is saying and kind of look at like what's the common thing? What is everybody feeling or not feeling? And how do I how do I improve it? Yeah. At the end of the day, good work will get noticed, you know, and it takes a little bit of luck too. It, it's um but but you make your luck by sticking your nose in it and not giving up and making phone calls and sending things to people. And um, I have an inbox full of, you know, emails. I have DMs on Instagram or Facebook that I, I can't respond to all of them. And sometimes that's just the thing, right? And every once in a while, if I have like a free moment on a Sunday and I start going through things, if something catches my eye, I'm like, oh, let me check this thing out. It's not me not wanting to mm -hmm. look. It's just there's an infant, you know, you don't have an infinite amount of time and, uh, and this all takes time. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to understand, know your audience, know that there's people out there who might be able to help you, but just, you know, you have to, you have to get lucky and get the right moment and get their attention. Uh, our industry traditionally has been very nepotistic mm -hmm. where, you know, friends and family, but I got to tell you, there's a um, there's a movement in today's world to not rely on that because you can you you people get excited about finding that diamond in the rough, finding that voice that is special, and that may not be your cousin Billy or your cousin Susie, right? Um, certainly, people get jobs because they're related to people. And, but I think they only really truly succeed if they have talent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen that happen around me. But for those who are just trying to break in, just be, be yourself, be aggressive in a good way, be persistent, yeah. uh, be professional, you know, read, read the room, know when to shut up, know when to speak up. Um, and if it's not your moment to speak up, you know, wait for it. Maybe it's another time. Maybe it's another day. But that I can say honestly from my experience, because like I said, I my my family came here from Brazil, and my dad had a deli in Queens, and they nobody was in the entertainment industry, right? Mm -hmm. So everything was hustling and um, waiting for the right time, but also doing the work. And then my work got noticed. Then you get lucky. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. And like you mentioned, sometime on a Sunday, somebody's going to read your script maybe. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Work. Yeah. So keep trying. So that's, that's great advice. Thank you. What are some lessons or some mistakes that you can now share with those at the beginning of the path to avoid? <laughs> um. I, when you sent me these, these questions and I read this one, I was like, that's a tough one because I've made mistakes, mm -hmm. but they're, they weren't at the beginning necessarily. You're open it's to like, sharing them. That's okay. No, no yeah. It, it, the, the mistakes yeah. were that once I, once I started directing and my desire to be a working director. There were a couple of times where I compromised not my integrity, but my my I did I did projects that I didn't love because it was work. Mm -hmm. And those never turned out well. Mm -hmm. It was and and then I stopped doing that. I was like I, I'm I'm I can only do things I believe in. And I want to do, I can't worry. Yeah, I have to pay my rent. And yes, I have to make money. But 
I need to, I need to make decisions that are going to propel me forward. And I can only do that if I love it. You, you can't do it if you don't love it. And um, I made that mistake a couple of times where I was like afraid of not working. And so I took a job and it didn't turn out well. And I could have told you in the beginning, if I think about it, that it wouldn't have turned out well because it was a job. And I now realize, and for, I've been very lucky because the last 20 years, I'm, I, I do shows I want to do. I don't always get the shows I want to get. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I get turned down. And when I pursue something that I love, I still lose those jobs to people. Um, I really wanted to direct Westworld after I saw season one. I, I went and I met with the showrunners because, you know, I'm at a point where I can get in the room, right? But I didn't get the job. I didn't get the gig. I have no problem admitting that because they just didn't think I was a right fit, mm -hmm. right? But does that mean I give up? Does that mean I, I think the lessons I learned along the way was you can't take that stuff personally. Mm -hmm. You, you got to just always go after the things you want to, that you love. Um, I know that if I had the opportunity, if I would have been given the job, I would have killed it. No doubt. Like that I feel if, uh, if I don't get the job, I have to walk away going, okay, what's the next one, <laughs> you know, or next time or whatever it is. So, and that's just, that's an important thing to, to learn because it, it's all about that, that mentality of um, I'm, I'm good at what I do and I just have to keep pushing and fighting for the things I want to do. But the mistake is to just do it when you don't love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that even even when you're so successful and working full time there are still situations when you might not get a job so that everybody knows that it's okay it happens of course. Like, any, like in any profession you go to interviews and here you might not get through but then something even better comes along so thank you for sharing that so that people don't get discouraged by these kind of situations along the way Marcos, it was amazing. Uh, I personally learned so much, so I appreciate your time. I appreciate your guidance. I can't wait to share all this with our viewers and to end this wonderful masterclass. Whom would you like to nominate to also send the elevator back down and help our aspiring actors or filmmakers? Well, because you are, the organization is the Pennsylvania Film mm -hmm. Industry Association. Commit. Yes, Pennsylvania so, uh, Industry Association. I, I think it should be Kevin Bacon because he's ah, from Philly. Yeah. He's from Philly and uh, you don't get more, um, you know, you don't get deeper in this industry than Kevin Bacon. I mean, there's a game named after him, right? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to send Kevin, I'm going to send Kevin a note Thank telling you. him he should do this because uh, he's a Philly guy mm -hmm. and he's one of the nicest guys. And um, I think he would have a lot to offer. Thank you. And he's immensely talented. So it would be an honor to learn from him. So thank you very much for this wonderful nomination. And thank you so much for your time and your truly practical advice and such amazing breakdowns. So thank you, Marcus. And to everybody who's been watching, we wish you best of luck and hope to see your films and TV shows on big screens and major streaming platforms. Good luck, everyone. Thank you.